Hello, hello, welcome back to the lab. It's time to find out exactly how much better this new cooling solution is. Our previous record is 50 watts. This puny little heatsink could do 50 watts, but it's time to see what this can do. It is time to see what our two 240 mil radiators and the uh, there's radiators, there's water blocks, there's water, there's all right, but before we do all that, I'm gonna try. Oh no, oh no, that screw's screwing this up. Oh yeah, oh yeah, look at that. Man, that stuff really sticks. Woo! Uh. Ah, close enough, we'll clean that up. Moment. There's two big questions that we need to answer today. What is the power limit for a single module, for one of those modules? And what's the power limit for the whole system? Uh, the first question is really important because it will likely reveal the thermal interface limit, like the thermal performance of the cooling solution for one module. The water's cold, relatively cold. You know, we're pumping heat out of this thing. Let's see how good the thermal transfer is from our MOSFET to the water. And now there's a lot of interfaces that need to happen there, right? So we're starting at the junction, the silicon. Then it needs to get through the package to the end, edge of that package. Then we've got our thermal interface material, that insulating high performance layered material that we talked about before. And then from there, we've got the copper of the water block. Then we've got the water on the other side of that water block. And then we've got the radiator with the fans blowing through it. So we need to get maybe 500 watts, maybe a thousand watts from that silicon through one, two, three, four, through a whole lot of junctions. And each one of those is going to need to be in the 0, 0.00 something range of degrees C per watt for this thing to work, right? Take any number, multiply it by 500, and we're talking about a lot of degrees. Thankfully that junction can get up to about 115, maybe about 100 would be where I'm comfortable. Um, before we'd really need to worry. Uh, so let's, I guess, let's find out. Now that second test is also important, the uh, total loop temp, because that'll tell us if we have enough radiator. And that's part of the reason why I wanted to go water cooling for this project. Because what I know is that if the water is cold enough, this system will perform as expected. What I don't know is how many radiators we need to keep that water cool enough. So when we try to load every single load what I expect to see, if the system's operating correctly, is they'll all hit their thermal limit at exactly the same time with the same power dissipation. And if that's not what we see, if we see the first block of the loop being colder than the last block of the loop, we're seeing significant temperature increase in our water as it cycles through the system. And now, these are computer water cooling parts, right? These are not, like, this is not how these parts were meant to be used. We're in kind of uncharted territory. So we're gonna find out together how well this works. I can't wait, I can't wait. Uh, that to say, I don't know if we've got enough radiator. I don't know if we could get 2000 watts out of this or even a thousand, right? That's a ton of heat to get out of this system. And remember, this isn't like a power supply where five to 10% of the energy flowing through it is dissipated in it. This is an electronic load. It needs to dissipate 100% of that power. Like, if you want to know what a thousand watts feels like, set it to a thousand watts and stick your hand behind it, and that will show you what a thousand watts feels like, which I think is amazing. So, we spent 22 videos in this series talking, and I say enough is enough. We got our three thermocouples installed, we've got them on channel, uh, I think, uh, one, four, I don't know. We got it on three channels, the first one in the loop, the last one in the loop, and one in the middle. So, we're gonna figure out how this system's behaving. For this test, we're stressing channel four. No real reason besides the very present over temperature indicator LED. And when that LED illuminates, that means the gate of our FET is locked out. Or in other words, set to negative eight volts. That's the hardware over temperature interlock. It's set to trip at a PCBA temperature of about 75C. And there's a copper shim between the PCBA and the isolated side of the transistor case. So it's thermally coupled, but loosely. So I would expect our junction to be hotter than 75C uh, well, I'm hoping, right? Maybe 85, maybe 90. I don't know what the package and the, the core of that die will be. Um, 
But at any rate, so there is that copper shim thermally coupling the PCBA and the isolated side of the transistor case together. I have this load connected via USB to graphically plot the data we're reading back from channel 4. This program is also collecting a log file, so check out the links in the description if you want to take a look at the collected data. A lot of goodness down there. Yeah, so this thing is probably the prettiest test equipment I've ever seen. I love the RGB, and I'm running out of things to say, so let's just wait for the system to hit thermal equilibrium or trip the over-temperature protection. Okay, seems like the limit is right around 275 watts. Realistically, I've seen this system dissipate more, at least 400 watts in one channel, but what I've noticed is that the temperature of the water starts to rise to an unacceptable level where we can't get the heat out of the part fast enough. Basically, the water gets too hot, then the cold plate gets too hot, and eventually the whole system just gets too hot. 275 watts just takes a really long time to heat up that water and start to violate those limits, so it's only barely flirting with the over-temperature threshold for a moment. Uh, also, don't think that I didn't notice that nasty lack of hysteresis we just saw, but thankfully the fault timer is driven by a comparator output, and that protection FET circuit has some intrinsic like reset time, so even if the, the set is oscillating like crazy, the load and that FET isn't really going to see that oscillation. But I'm going to add hysteresis for the community edition because it's just nasty and I, and I don't like it. Back to cooling though, uh, I've seen some hacks where people put a radiator in an ice bucket of water, which we might need to try just for fun. More radiators, more fans, all of these things are options. More cooling. This part can stretch its legs more than what we're giving it right now, but it might need sub-ambient cooling to get there, so that's unfortunate. That said, I don't usually work with more than 24 volts or more than 10 amps, so knowing that we can gang all four of these in parallel for up to 1000 watts from a single supply isn't half bad. Uh, given that a Rigol 200 watt unit runs for about $600, I'm feeling pretty good about what we've done so far. Uh, that's not the end of this story though, because it's time to see if this cooling solution can take the heat out of four channels at maximum power. What we're watching now is all channels set to 250 watts. I have a thermocouple on channels 2, 3, and 4, which means that we can see the block temperatures of the two adjacent FETs and the block temperature of the first and last FETs in this loop. Since all of these blocks are dissipating the same amount of power, we'd expect to see the same temperature at every component, water temperature held constant. Now, water temperature held constant is a pretty typical assumption in PC water cooling, but these blocks are doing a lot of work, so I think it's worthwhile to validate that assumption. It's probably more work than they were ever really designed to handle. I know, I know, digital electronics dissipate power too. I am analog bias, whatever, whatever, whatever. Before I go and eat my hat and throw out my, yeah, whatever, I'm bad at these, but water cooling is pretty amazing, but it's not magic, okay? So, this is an unrelenting load. We're basically asking for 100% duty cycle all day, where digital loads tend to have little breaks. They tend to be more bursty. What I was surprised to see is that the last block in our loop started to run into its thermal limit pretty quickly. I mean, at least relatively quickly compared to the one channel test. After a little investigation, we can clearly see the block temps were all over the place. There was more than 10 degrees delta between every FET temperature at every single block. We are shoving so much heat into this water cooling loop, and these radiators are sucking so much heat out of this water cooling loop. Water cooling is amazing. As we approach equilibrium, the four blocks are increasing the water temperature by about 50 degrees Celsius from one end of the loop to the other, and the two radiators are managing that heat and bringing it back down by about 50 degrees Celsius. Water cooling is amazing. Could we have achieved this performance with a more traditional heatsink? Yeah, probably but it might have needed integrated heat pipes, and it might have weighed 300 pounds. That to say, the air coming out of this system is unsurprisingly warm. This thing basically feels like a hairdryer or a space heater, and that is not a real surprise. Okay, what does this mean for our project? Well, what we've learned is that contrary to popular PC water cooling guidance, loop order seems to matter. If we can maybe rearrange the loop so we hit two of the heat sources and then one of the radiators and then the other two and then the second radiator, maybe we can get this thing so we can push the system a little harder before we hit the thermal limits of any one channel when they're all being hit. 
But that said, we've still got a pretty long time before anything hits a limit, and maybe we can pull some sneaky tricks in software. Like, for a processor with a cooling solution like this, they allow it to burst up to a higher, or whatever, turbo, boost, whatever you want to call it. It dissipates more power for a short amount of time, and then ratchets that back to a steady state maximum. So maybe for 15 minutes, we can pull 400 watts in every channel. But then we know we need to dial it back to 275. Because a lot of testing that you're doing with an electronic load isn't necessarily steady state. And being able to pull a gulp of power that's above the like steady state uh, limit might be useful. So we can build some software in our locks to make that happen. Yeah, it's just complicated because water has so much thermal mass, so we can actually play with those limits a little bit. I think there's a lot of ways to tweak the system. We can tweak the compensator for faster transient response. We can tweak the firmware for that burst or turbo behavior, like I said. Um, yeah, we don't need to limit the instantaneous power as much as the steady state. So it's just something to keep in mind. I don't know about you, but I'm pretty happy with what we accomplished today. I'm pretty happy with what we saw. We just achieved a 20x improvement in thermal capacity for the electronic load solution and achieved a 5x improvement in power handling capability for each module. That is not bad for one spin of hardware and not bad considering that we built this in a modular way that allows for further improvement. If we get a bigger chassis, sure it might be huge, we can throw five more radiators at it and, you know, sub-ambient nonsense, chillers, and we can use anything that fits on a standard computer. And that is pretty amazing. I mean, we could get a water chiller hooked up to this thing. That'd be pretty sweet. I can't wait to see where this project ends up. And if you like this video and you can't wait for more, if you can't wait for more tweaks, testing, and improvements over time with this hardware, let me know by getting subscribed, hitting that like button, or leaving a comment down below. It really means a lot to me. Coming up soon, we'll be testing the transient response of the system and fault tolerance of the new design. I can't wait. If you want to support the channel, consider checking out the Patreon page linked in the description. It really helps us out a lot. So thank you. Yes, thank you to everyone who decided to become a member. You're a big part of making this all possible. Most of all, I hope that you learned something great today, and I hope to see you again soon. So thanks for watching EE for everyone, and thank you for staying till the end. Bye!